All right, um, welcome to the stream, the show of show and tell of Opal. Um, thank you all for tuning in. Um, this is a pretty big device, so I think this uh, stream will be probably a lot longer than usual. Um, but. I'm just going to try and dig into everything about it, basically. I think um, for the agenda, I want to like go through sort of the overarching concept of the device and then um, kind of talk about each, each engine and as we go along, uh, make like a track with them, basically. So I'll talk about the first engine and make something with it and then we'll keep building. and. As always, it's fine to chime in in the chat and ask questions and everything. And please do let me know if the levels are good. Um, mostly the like audio voice balance. Um, so just uh, let me know in the, in the chat if it's really off. Um, and if there's anything you want me to cover, um, as we go along, just write, and I'll I'll keep an eye on it. Um, so yeah, let's see. Try to pop out this chat somehow. So for those of you who don't know, um, Opal is sort of a, a software take on like a hardware groove box with multiple tracks and multiple sound engines that each can be controlled by this sequencer with parameter locks, meaning that like each step can change and, and interact with the sound engine while it also can introduce like interesting rhythmic effects as well as like different logic for the sequencer to make patterns that sort of evolve more over time rather than stay static and um it's been something we worked on for a long time and uh yeah i think it came together very well <laughs> um and uh, what we're looking at right now is sort of the main window. This has like all these different tracks and synth engines, but they also come as separate devices. So you could use them in like a drum rack or as like a little melodic synth and we'll, we'll get into how to do that and how that looks. So I think first of all, um, I'm going to show just how to like get started with with all of this what you get essentially when you download it because we had a lot of questions of how to install stuff and with max for live stuff that's not like official ableton packs it can be a little difficult to get it into um your live um ableton live folders and stuff so i'm just gonna show you how to do that so then i need to pop over to the screen um so Let's just close that down for now. So 
um, on my desktop here I have this opal.alp and um, what this is is an Ableton Live package and it's essentially something you open in Ableton and then that unpacks like a live set with content and everything. Uh, so I'm just gonna make a new folder for myself because um, I just need, uh, I have a special thing going on here for the stream as well. Um, but basically when you open this ALP in, um, in, uh, in Ableton, you'll get this um, confirmation, confirmation screen where to put it. And I think you can just extract it kind of anywhere as a temporary place. Um, so for example, your desktop. Um, and uh, after that's done, um, you'll be left with this Opal project that has all of the different devices, including a live set to get you sort of started with some demos, what it can do, etc. And sort of a nice structure for this, just more for housekeeping, is to put it in your user library in Live. So where they find that is down here in Places in Live. You can press User Library. Um, and I usually recommend to create a folder here. So just hit new folder and call it maybe devices. And then we can right click that and show, uh, choose to view in Finder or, or Explorer if you're using Windows. I'm on a Mac, obviously. So then you pop up that folder, devices. And uh, now um, we just basically drag and drop our exported ALP, the whole project folder here. And the reason why you want to keep this sort of intact is because it's easy to lose the connection between presets and Maxwell Live devices. So this is why we recommend this sort of structure. So when you've done that, you'll have all the different um, devices that Opal comes with, as well as the main device. And they'll, they'll be housed in this folder and you'll be able to access it via your um, live uh, browser, which is very handy. Um, yeah, I'm just gonna copy over this. Um, and uh, yeah, so um, what you get is two different kinds of uh, Opal versions. Um, there's this one, this is the main one that's, that we're looking at right now. It's sort of housed in the rack and you press this button to open the editor and you get the full device. There's also a version called um, the rack version, which is housed in your rack. We can load that up, for example. It's in this folder called Opal Rack. Um, and this one will just open it in the device rack in Ableton, which means that it will be shown here uh, down like a regular device, um, which, yeah, for, you know, for, for, uh, choice sake you can uh, work with either of them they're also patch compatible so you can sort of drag and drop them onto projects when you want to interchange the different versions and as i said all of these different um synths that opal have each track is its own synth they're um, called different things that we'll get into um, but they also come as separate devices so i can for example drag out the reverb what we're listening to now maybe i want to add more reverb I get this uh, uh, extra, but it's not too. Uh, <laughs> so make a reverb. Um, but same goes for all of the uh, different synths. You can drag those into a track, and it will work like any synth in, in Ableton, basically. And uh, right now, I'm. I've kind of got, got them then configured to this color that I like, but you can change all that, which I think is really fun. So, you know, Opal, you can sort of set the U <laughs> of it. And, and uh, I'm getting way ahead of myself, but I just love this so much. <laughs> to be able to set your own color for stuff, I think it's so much fun. So you can change the accent color and you can make this a part of the standalone devices too, if you want to. And I'm sure I'll do that later, but just a, <laughs> a bit of a side note, but this is sort of what you get anyway, is all of these devices separate as well as the main device and um, the presets here 
compatible comes with are for the separate devices, which are not compatible with the main device for technical reasons, but has a few nice, uh, um, a few different nice uh, examples of what you can do with stuff. Um, yeah, so that's kind of how to get it installed, get it going. Um, and once that in there, you get this uh, sort of a sort of a machine itself to create music and sound, and it has like a so it's all revolving around this built-in sequencer, um, which is controlling these tracks, and um, what you get to just get a rundown of each type of synthesizer. Um, we have on. Uh, these four different icons here represent a track. So each synth engine has its own track. Um, and the first one here, the little uh, diamond or whatever is called Gem. This is uh, an FM synth. Um, it's sort of, all of these synths are sort of like skewed in making percussive sounds. They're all sort of drum synths more or less, but they're also made in a way where you can sort of choose for yourself how much of a drum sound you want it to be. So they kind of excel at percussive synthesis, but you don't actually need to make percussive sounds with them. They're quite nice for melodic stuff as well. And the gem synth being an FM synth is, is one of the more versatile types of sound generators in Opal. Um, it's got this two operator structure, which personally I just really love two operator FM. Um, and um, it's uh, sort of a classic FM synth, but with some nice little tweaks to make it more modern and, and very playable and fun to, to interact with. And you can make kind of anything from like really classic FM sounds to more like virtual analog style stuff almost, because it has this feedback engine, which just like our other synth, Glenta, sort of uh, tracks the pitch and offsets, uh, or rather adjusts for different, um, how to say, different like pitches and make sure it never like aliases in this specific way and just make it sound kind of consistent and, and smooth or uh, rich. Um, and next we have something called Mass, which is a physical modeling synth synthesizer. This uses a t type of physical modeling called modal synthesis. It's essentially a series of bandpass filters that are really narrow and they get um, they get an impulse fed to them so they sort of ring out so it's sort of uh, um, like inspired by sort of how you physically strike an object which then resonates um, but the parameters are all sort of in in like synth space they're not trying to like actually represent uh, anything from the real world they're, they're just using this this synthesis method to kind of coax new sounds out of which i think is very exciting it's a very um it can get very weird and alien um but also vaguely uh natural sounding as well due to sort of how um it's in it's in it's like inner working still sort of like something that's supposed to mimic real world resonances and uh, next we have an engine called dust and this is sort of a pulsar noise synthesizer which uh, I guess is more or less gibberish but <laughs> uh, pulsar synthesis is a, a, the a theoretical or rather a type of synthesis named by Curtis Rhodes sort of the, the main propagator of um, granular synthesis and it's <clears throat> similar to granular it takes small snippets of sound and sort of plays play them back very quickly and overlap them and sort of randomize their pitch and and, and everything like that to make different kinds of noises and, and, and textures and and, uh, and and sort of metallic sounds and a little bit of everything in terms of like what you would, would call a noisy sound from like hi-hats to just like noise. Um, and it's essentially using these little, little granules to build up a, a, a wider sound. Um, and <clears throat> next we have a sampler 
um, which uh, we've never done anything with samples before at Forest, so this is uh, a first for us, which has been really fun to work on. It's a uh, it's, uh, sort of um, a very straightforward sample player that's just supposed to sound really good and, and be nice to work with, but it has this granular engine that really expands what you can do with it and it lets you really zoom in on a sound and, and, and uh, start manipulating it in these different ways where you can stretch it out or, or compact it or zoom in on a specific part of it and sort of uh, make that more larger than, than what it in inherently is. And uh, this is also, again, all of these are sort of meant for percussion, but they're wider in, in scope, but um, it has some little tweaks to the granular engine, with, which lends itself well to working with percussive stuff. Um, and lastly, we have an effects track, which uh, hosts two different effects. It's the void reverb, which is, uh, yeah, it's a reverb. <laughs> uh, it's uh, sort of designed to to let you find different kinds of reverbs by mixing between three different reverb methods that all sort of play off of each other. So you have sort of a, a early diffuse stage which sort of just smooths out the initial attack. You have an early reflection stage with this sort of your close first hit of the sound and then the late reflection, which is this long wash of, of sound. Sorry, hit the microphone there. Um, and you can sort of mix between these different uh, different types of reverbs, essentially, to create to create uh, different types of reverb sounds, which is which is really nice. Um, and uh, then we have. Probably the weirdest thing in all of this uh, is the Flux sampler. And this is a sampler that essentially always records your pattern and it stores it as 16 different slices, which you can at any point sort of choose to play back one of the slices. And this can be used to kind of, you know, make like an instant remix of what you're working with or add like some, some layer of, of sort of stuff that kind of is what you were working on but on top of itself you can pitch it differently you can play it back in a granular fashion so you could like slow down and pitch it up um, so you essentially get this extra layer from the same source to work with and this is really fun to introduce weird variations and interesting textures that are sort of based on the pattern and you can since you can have everything running on their own uh, lengths and times which we'll get into it can be this very organic um evolving thing um and can be hard to kind of get your grasp around because it's like a little abstract but once you start using it it's 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 really cool you can also use it to like build a reverb and stuff like that uh, i mean build a delay sorry um which is quite cool um okay so I think next I'm just gonna, yeah, any questions about this while I drink some water? <laughs> So, um, so let's sort of try to sum up how this is all connected. So as I said, it's a five track groove box or rhythm machine, drum machine, however you want to use it. Um, and um, each track has a dedicated sound engine with um, a sequencer tied to it. or It's all the same sequencer with different tracks, with different engines. And uh, you can essentially, you know, make melodies or rhythms or uh, any type of like rhythmical structure. Um, so the, the left hand of the screen is the sequencer. Um, actually, I'm gonna 
change our view so we just see the device. I kind of like that a lot. Um, get a, so the left hand, oh, my pointer isn't showing. Well, that's not good, so let's maybe. So the, the left hand of the screen right here um, is the actual sequencer and this changes as you view different tracks. And uh, the top control here is the pattern. So you can have up to 64 different patterns and uh, I can change here for the hell of it. <laughs> Maybe it's something. And uh, so um, basically it changes between different patterns and each pattern holds um, sound information of each track, so it's essentially like switching between presets and it holds uh, like the step sequencer data and all that kind of stuff. You can name it here, uh, my pattern, and uh, all of this is sort of stored in the live set. Um, and uh, to work with that, um, you basically just Use your mouse and click in each uh, of these uh, different steps to uh, to enter uh, velocity information. <laughs> so when the velocity is above zero or, or there's something in the step, it will be regarded regarded as um, being like an active step. It will it will send out a trigger to the to the um, to the um, um, synth engine. And um, um, each track has its own length, so you could set it to uh, different track lengths, which, mean, which means that the sequencer is polymetric. Um, so you can have like different meters running on different, uh, the kind of running, uh, revolving around each other. It can have different um, uh, time scales, so you can make it run slower can show this on some good, uh, let's take a new pattern here and maybe play like a easy to understand sample. Um, so if I do just a 4-4 four, four here, I can slow this down to uh, uh, three quarters of time and it will be slower. So for example here, if you want to do like a polyrhythm, you could decrease the step length to 12. So this will essentially now be eight note, note triplets. Um, um, so if I make like um, like a sound on this one, let's just do like a little uh, uh, like some some nice little uh, percussive click. increase the volume. No, the volume is probably good. Um, so yeah, you can have these sort of interesting uh, um, rhythmical relationships. So it does sort of like polyrhythms, polymeters, but polyrhythms, uh, you, can, you can't you can like quite, uh, it, the grid can't be expanded to do a polyrhythm. You'll have to program it this way. And then if you do polymeters, it will, you know, be something like Um, and you can also run the each track. So this is per track, of course, all of this. Um, you can also run it uh, in ping pong. So instead of going just just straight like this, you can go make it go back and forth. As you see, the sort of dot above the steps will now be in like a pendulum motion. Um, so that's for the sequencer basics. And then we have this whole section under here um that um lets you enter different kinds of data into the step sequencer so this is a step sequencer so this is where you can do parameter locking which you can set each uh, parameter to um to do different things on each step which is which is really cool um so for example let's listen to this again maybe a little less abrasive sound <laughs> um, so for example if I have some sort of 
Um, I could go into this uh, parameter locking mode and, and press any of these um, any of these uh, different uh, parameters that are high highlighted. If I press one of those, uh, you see this text here change, and this is um, uh, this lets you change this parameter per step. So now I have envelope release, for example, and these sliders down here sort of represent that parameter for that step. So when um, so when these are gray, there's no information. And if I increase this slider here, you'll see that it turns into the accent color. And now we'll hear like a longer note on, or longer uh, release time on that uh, step. So this lets you sort of sculpt uh, each step to something radically different. So for example, I could pitch this way down, um, increase, uh, uh, some of these values and uh, uh, I'm doing this sort of more or less blind so let's hope that uh, <laughs> kind of funny so now it's more like some uh, not so good bass drum <laughs> So that's sort of the gist of parameter locking in the sequencer and how it in, like engages with the sound engine. So all these parameters here uh, are lockable, uh, essentially. And uh, there's more modulation at hand. You can, um, let's uh, load maybe some interesting, um, So here we don't have that much uh, parameter locking, but we have modulation going. And, and so each of these engines have a modulation page. So if you click this uh, button right here, you'll pop open the modulation page. And this lets you um, configure the modulation matrix and add modulation from an LFO, an envelope, a random source, and velocity. So this uh, little sequence, for example, has uh, like random modulation level. As you can see here, um, this uh, column here has M level selected. So if you click that, you can actually reroute what uh, parameter we want to uh, modulate. So the modulation matrix, you can kind of swap these things out and create uh, different things that evolve um, and I've applied some randomness to this parameter. So every time it's triggered, it will have a little bit of randomness. Um, so if I increase that. And a more obvious thing is to like have random tuning per, per, per step. And then you can apply LFO. And the LFO, you can uh, sort of skew each wave. So we have sine, triangle, square, um, but the sine can be bent like this, kind of warped into different shapes, which uh, will kind of give it a quicker bump. <laughs> which sounds really funny. Um, the triangle you can you can uh, sort of uh, compact into a uh, sawtooth wave. Um, and the square you can change its uh, duty, um, the, the pulse width. And the LFO can be re-triggered per step. Um, you know, it sort of changes, it like starts from, from zero each time. It can be tempo synced. Um, um, yes. And there's also a handy modulation envelope. <laughs> <It's>, uh, <laughs> which can be looped. Um, and uh, yeah, 
And of course, velocity can affect this as well. <laughs> for really strange results. Um, and each of these engines have this uh, modulation page. And this goes for the individual devices as well. They all sort of have this, uh, it's, it's essentially the same thing of the right hand of the device. Um, and sort of the last screen to tie all this together is the mixer, uh, which you've probably seen me open here and there, which I can enable and disable uh, tracks. Let's try it now. Mixer has a uh, level control of each track, of course, and this button mutes it or unmutes it, the audio. Um, you can also mute the, the sort of triggers um, with automation. I'll show that at some point. <laughs> There's so much to this device, um, but we will get into all of it, um, I hope. <laughs> no, we will, but anyway. Um, uh, level, of course, pan below here. Um, and tone, which is sort of a uh, an EQ filter, you could say, it's uh, pitch relative, which means that you can sort of use it to retract uh, upper or higher frequencies. Um, sorry, lower or higher frequencies. So, for example, this little rhythm thing here. If I increase tone, it will start removing low frequencies. And what's nice about it is that it will always remove it relative to its pitch. So most of the time you have uh, harmonics that sort of uh, are more or less predictable. So the tone filter will <clears throat> always remove stuff in a way where you can still always hear the sound. So if you pitch it way up, um, it will sort of always remove the, the, the same amount of um, tonality maybe so it's sort of consistent when you pitch it which is nice uh, especially when you work with a low pass everything will sort of be damped uh, it's not like just applying a low pass filter um, and under here um, let's just uh, remove all these oh, remove all these uh, steps there uh, lastly, we have the, the reverb send. Yeah. Um, so that's, I would say that's the general structure. And there's also a settings page, but don't really have to worry about that right now. It doesn't do that much. Let's do a new pattern. Let's dig into the synth engines. So uh, everybody knows I love FM, I do. And I've made yet another FM synth and I'm sure there will be many more. <laughs> and uh, I really love this two operator structure. I think it's a very simple but elegant way to make a lot of different cool sounds, especially for percussion, I think two operator is cool. Um, so um, this big display here, um, let's see if I can maybe change the view a little cooler. This main display, so I think the highlighting works, yes. This uh, main display right here um, is uh, sort of the output waveform, so it gets you sort of an idea of the wave shape you're working with. Um, so maybe we could listen to... Uh... So by default, it's just a sine wave. Um, as you hear, it has sort of like a clickiness to it, and this is intentional. Um, this is, uh, so essentially, usually with, with FM synths, you start at the zero point of the waveform, but this is not very good for percussion because it will sound kind of flat. So it starts a quarter into the wave. So essentially it starts sort of like at, at the first peak. 
and this gives it a much nicer transient response so when um, we apply like a pitch uh, envelope and stuff like that it sounds snappy it sounds very like fat <laughs> um, and uh, yeah so as so we hear just a sine wave and if we increase the modulation here um, we'll start hearing modulation from the modulating oscillator um, and below are a bunch of um, a bunch of uh, highlighting doesn't work are you well the the sort of white uh, the white highlighting I was referring to I think that works right um, so um, sorry I just need to rearrange my windows over here um, so uh, all these bottom controls um, um, pertain to um, the modulator more or less um, so the ratio here is the modulating ratio so sort of this two to one relationship um, will give you this sort of square-ish uh, wave shape um, and as you see I increase uh, the modulation amount um, the sort of gray waveform um, is increasing in amplitude this is the modulator so if I now change the ratio here we'll see that the wave behind it gets a uh, denser denser amount of periods to it um, so and that will essentially change um, the resulting sound just like any other FM synth uh, interesting fact about this is that it uses a sort of strange um, double operator structure <laughs> Um, and and um, it essentially has two modulators doing the same uh, ratio, but uh, in a sort of um, uh, exponential fashion. And this this just makes it sound a lot smoother and, and, and richer. Um, weird fun fact. <laughs> um, and if we bring it down to one, it will sound more like sort of a square uh, saw wave ish. Um, and the ratio can be. Uh, this is the course control, which changes how many periods are in, in the modulator. Of the, of, um, and these are always relative. The, the ratio is always relative to like the base frequency of the sound. So um, whatever frequency you're playing, it will be sort of time 16 then. And this creates this tonal relationship. And, and essentially, it's sort of like a harmonic series. And you introduce modulation depth. And then that uh, imparts itself into the main wave. And that creates this whole sidebands and fm and all that stuff i don't i'm not gonna dig too deep into like fm um, um theory here but yeah um so if we have like a ratio of one um we can detune that add some fine uh fine uh offset to the to the ratio which will make it inharmonic so it has like a little wobble to it let's let's pull up the so as you hear it's getting this weird little inharmonicity to it it's it's got some more bottom end as well because of the side bands and you can sort of see in the waveform that it's a little uneven um, and as you can see here the the fine control sort of jumps between uh, these coarser values but if you hold down shift you can of course set um, the, the fine ratio to whatever you want for, for really inharmonic sounds Um, and that's good for bells or what have you. <laughs> and this control down here is called drift. And this is different from fine. It essentially is not tied to the bass frequency, but it's applying an offset in frequency to the modulator. And this is useful when you want like like this sort of like drifting in the modulation but you don't want it to change when you uh have different frequencies so the ratio will always be relative to the frequency right but this drift control will always be consistent so it's off by maybe um like a hertz or two but it will always be the same amount of offset and this can be really useful for you making these sort of like little uh, like uh, like drifts in the sound or wobbles or what have you it gets more obvious with longer sounds uh, I could show that in a minute um, 
and these things can be shaped uh, of course the modulator can be shaped over time its amplitude and this contour envelope right here um, pertains to that so uh, this is an envelope that you might know from uh, a certain other FM groove box um, it's called an ADE envelope it has an attack segment uh, decay segment and then you can adjust the end level of the decay which means that instead of always decaying to like the minimum value which would result in a sine wave you can sort of let it retain a little bit of modulation which is really useful for making all kinds of sounds um, so you can make these little plucks and as we hear if we wouldn't have end uh, level here we wouldn't really be able to make these plucks and still have a little bit of timbrality to it. So if I increase this, we'll hear. So then you get this pluck of the timbre, but also sort of this steady tone as well. Um, and uh, then we have a feedback control. So this controls the modulation sent from the modulator back into itself, which sort of makes it sharp. Um, and this is um, similar to our other FM synth Glenta. It's, it's bipolar, which creates a different kind of sounding feedback. Um, I usually describe it as with positive values. It's sort of, if you look at the, the try to look at the, the uh, gray wave behind, you can see that it sort of starts to look like a um, sawtooth wave. And if if we do it negatively, it's hard to see here, but it essentially sounds a little more like a square or some or a pulse or something like that. And this is just good to get different types of sounds out of it. And same same goes for the modulation depth. It's it's uh, bipolar as well, and that might seem overkill <laughs> in some cases. But I think with this sort of two operator structure, that really allows us to make a lot of different sounds. And especially for um, stuff that sounds more or less like a little analog. So if I have this two to two ratio and I decrease the modulation depth and decrease the feedback both negatively, um, it starts to sort of make like a triangle wave. So now we'll get a pretty sharp, a little too sharp triangle wave uh, out of this which uh, is one of my favorite waveforms anyway. <laughs> um, and then of course, by, by changing sort of the depth of this, we get all these different tonalities and the more, the less depth you have, the more bass you get. So that of course lends its very, itself very well to bass drum. I would say that gem is probably one of the better synths for like a, a kick or something like that. Oh, I kicked my camera as I said that. Um, apply a little contour maybe to get almost like something that almost sounds like a filter if you close your eyes and imagine really hard. <laughs> um, and then last but not least, we can introduce some noise into this. And I really like being able to have both, like you can get noise out of feedback if you really crank it. But maybe you also just wanna um, have a little bit of that stuff going on. You just want like a noise layer on top of it. So this noise uh, control introduces actually linear FM noise into uh, this uh, general FM structure. Um, so we kind of combine in different FM worlds here with digital FM, it's always face modulation like the DX7 or whatever, same as this, but the noise is linear FM, but this just gives it a nice grit, I feel like. So uh, let's just decrease the modulation to hear this better. Um, you won't we'll hear a tiny bit when it's uh, when the decay is at its minimum, but if you increase that, you start hearing this noise. And uh, it's just really nice when you're making different types of, types of percussion to have this little noise uh, transient and uh, if I make like a snappy I'm 
of snappy envelope. We can start to hear quite quite nice bass drum shaping here. Uh, maybe even a little less decay on the noise. Um, and lastly, we have our amp envelope. Um, and this is an attack hold release envelope. And uh, this is the same for all the engines, as you can see, except for the effects. Um, and uh, what you can do is, of course, you know, make the sound duller or just let it be as clicky as you want. And for something like a kick, as I think we're doing now, <laughs> um, you can extend the hole to get a bit more oomph. Um, and um, now we can also uh, start thinking about pitch envelope. So the top row here are some like extra things on top of the synth engine. So uh, this this is just a tune offset, which is handy for if you want to like transpose the sound and you have like a melody locked in there or whatever, um, you can just instantly transpose it. Um, but what we want to do is have a pitch envelope. So this is the control here with the little down arrow. This is how uh, many semitones up the pitch envelope starts at. So it, it, it's just a decay envelope that starts at like a semitone uh, offset somewhere. So it's relative to the bass pitch and then it goes down. Um, so 72 would be very like a sap. And uh, this is the length of the decay. So if I set that to like 10, it would as you can hear, like a very aggressive sap. And I can even make that. So yeah, and then you got your got your uh, bass drum. And of course, um, you can vary this a lot and make like a lot of different interesting little for like a softer 808-ish. You can sort of tune that down a little bit. Um, and another thing Gem has that is really cool to play with is um, Unison. Um, so for example, if I have a sound where I'm fading in the modulation like this, um, I can apply a little bit of unison and we'll get kind of these strange facey, which I personally find really cool. You sort of, because the oscillator is always reset right it's it's always consistent every time you trigger it so when you also reset the unison you'll get these like facey weird sounds but the unison can also be tuned um to semitone so the value you see here would represent a semitone so if you enter seven that will be a g above like a fifth which is uh not super audible in this low <laughs> Or maybe so uh, it's quite nice for making these little... uh, you can make like a little uh, melody synth melody with it
yeah, that's kind of gem. And um, yeah. Um, like I said, I thought we should probably try and uh, make um, make a sequence which, with each engine. It's already been an hour of stream. This is going to be really long. <laughs> uh, but bear with me. And again, if there are any questions while I do this, or if you're bored, <laughs> let me know, and I'll, I'll try and, uh, I don't know, do a little dance or figure something out. Um, or if you, you're really into this, also let me know. <laughs> Take your time. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> um, so I think, okay, so I... I I want to make one of these like weird facey sounds, uh, maybe also like a bass line because you can do that on one track. So, um, so I'm gonna just crank up the hold. thing going so what I'm gonna what I'm doing right now is I'm using um, so as I said here as I'm highlighting these different um, steps um, uh, these different uh, lock types as they're called so right now we're looking at as I showed before the parameter locks um, but there's also note there is probability modulo ratchet and nudge and we'll get into all these but what I'm doing right now is just changing the note value. So the gray ones are this default note down here, as you can see when I change this F to different things. Um, maybe F sharp, yeah. Um, so uh, when I change this here, it takes on the accent color, which means that it's locked. So the, the note will be different for this step, so. But what I want to do here is, first of all, I don't want the pitch envelope on this one. So I select the pitch sweep time, oops, <laughs> the pitch sweep time right here. I click this um, and then I uh, click this step here, uh, the slider, and I lock that to minimum. <laughs> And I also want it to be an octave above, but not so often. So <laughs> if I press Command while I click any of these steps, I can copy paste. Um, maybe I'll just think about a little bit more what I want to do. 
so say that I want this exact sound, but on another step, I, I don't want to have to like redo all these things, like change the lock, everything, blah, blah, blah. But so what I can do is hold down command or control on Windows, click that step. So just this main thing that's highlighted now, click that, hold down Alt or Option on Mac and click this next step and it will paste the same sound there. Nice. And I probably want a little less mod attack. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> okay. Uh, so now comes one of my favorite features of all time in any sequencer is modulo logic. So this is uh, the one that's now has accent color in this row down here. Um, and this lets you decide kind of, so you're counting each loop and you decide which loop of the pattern this step is actually gonna be triggered on. So all of them by default is one to one. So this is first loop, first count of the first loop this will be triggered which means uh if you count all loops as one and the first one is going to get triggered it's always going to be triggered right so if i now change this one this step right here to one out of two so it's going to only trigger one out of two loops so um the first time i run the pattern it will actually trigger um, and the second time the pattern goes around it won't <laughs> But I wanted the other way around where I wanted to start triggering on the second loop. So it's like, uh, you know. Cool. Um, and then I also want like a really screechy one right here, but only on the fourth uh, count. So, uh, yeah, let's see a little more unison and uh like longer maybe it should be over here um <laughs> yeah maybe <laughs> maybe not like that i was thinking deeper uh oops uh Ah, let's go with it. Or not, I don't know, this turned out really weird. Let's just add like a little pling right here, like a really oh, like a really high pitch like do. <laughs> uh, also, stop me if this is really boring. Um, hopefully, it's not. Let's try and just this one should have like almost like a sine wave. It's like a short little. Not too much no envelope <laughs> yes so this one on like the eighth count so it's gonna be a really long time and then i'm gonna do a special little thing <laughs> where uh let's click the reverb send um, this will be now the thing that's lockable and let's like dish that into the reverb <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, I feel like I've made this pattern maybe 500 times in my life, but I like it. Mm. 
so yeah ah, it's a nice you know two operator you shouldn't you shouldn't like you shouldn't discredit it it's it's good uh we could also you know go in and add a little bit of random just for no let's not let's not no no random uh, <laughs> um yeah and and like for example if you need like less bass you can go in so yeah um cool um now we have that going for us so okay uh that's that synth um any questions about gem before i move on to mass just quick quick please P quick questions <laughs> Say when you say a pattern. Yes, if I now change pattern to like this empty one and go back, it will be the same stuff. So each pattern holds the sounds, the sequence data, everything. So when you switch between patterns, you're essentially switching out all the machine stuff. So it's like you know, uh, it's like a certain hardware group box you might be familiar with from Sweden. Uh, yeah. Um, all right, gem, uh, mass. Let's talk about mass. So um, let's mute gem so we don't listen to that all the time. So mass. Um, how do you do smooth multiples p lock? Not sure what that means exactly. Um, I don't think I quite understand that question. Um, Anyway, um, mass. So as I said before, this is a physical modeling synthesizer. Um, that means this sort of technology started as a way to try to, try to replicate acoustic sounds. Um, it's essentially, it's called modal synthesis, this kind of physical modeling. And it's, it's based around a bank of, of bandpass filters. And for those of you who don't know, I can, I can show here. Um, so, um, if I go in here to my audio effects and choose the auto filter, if I do bandpass, um, you see here that it's like a narrow, um, peak. So the idea is to have a bunch of these narrow peaks, um, to, uh, in series at like harmonic distances um, in, in frequency in order to replicate different types of sounds. And when you when you throw like an impulse or a noise or something into it, it sort of reacts to that, um, filters it, but also pings the filter, creating a resonance and a material. Um, and um, um, when you just trigger it by default, it just sounds like kind of a lo-fi um, saw wave. Um, and this is because we have like an exponential drop in amplitude per, um, uh, per uh, partial, you can say. But then we also have like, a, like a, the distance between each is just like one in the harmonic series. So it creates like a sort of saw wave. Um, and what we then can do with that is to sort of detune all of the partials, like change the spread of them, the like sort of the trajectory of their frequencies and the balance of their amplitudes to create different kinds of timbres. So, um, for example, if I click this main um, uh, control here you and drag you will see that it changes the distance between the partials which starts to sound more like some sort of weird membrane you're hitting
and the sort of amplitude or sorry the pitch of this will have like very i think uh mass is really good to work with different pitches like highs will like allow you to make different kinds of sounds like if you retract all of the the partials on a lower frequency it will just kind of sound like a bunch of sine waves uh interacting but if we pitch it way up it will start to sound like more like a more like maybe a me metallic thing um even you know and this is sort of at some point we'll be able to make a hi-hat out, out of this thing and I'll, I'll i'll get to that eventually um so um yeah and if you double click these parameters they will sort of jump out to their default um yeah and when you sort of expand them to the maximum they will all sort of be at a power of two i think um which makes sort of this nice bell sound and uh that's where it starts to sound a little more physical maybe because like a saw wave in nature is maybe not the most common uh sound you hear so besides being able to con con sort of expand and contract you can uh, let's add a little bit of facing you can also use this warp uh, uh, control and this sort of pushes all the partials to sort of different um so it pushes them together make them denser which creates sort of a weird um, which creates different clusters of uh timbres and, and, and harmonics interacting can be useful for like introducing a little more high frequency or some interesting tonality um, and what it's being triggered by right now is just an impulse um, and this is causing the bandpass filters to ring out and um, you can also use noise to trigger them um as well as the impulse so this section right here noise and noise amp controls the level and tonality of the noise part of the sound so um if i take this um this control of the envelope and drag it upwards it will control the amplitude of, of the noise so now we start hearing noise in the sound which again uh you know is akin to maybe hitting like a snare drum with its ratchet where you hear like these beads hitting the skin of the snare drum uh or the snare i guess it's called <laughs> the snare thing the little <laughs> of the snare drum um you know it's kind of and we can change the the filter um uh, of the of the noise which um this is useful for different kind of noise and, and tonalities and if you increase increase the noise level to its max it will be only noise triggering we've removed the impulse altogether which is nice for sounds that you know you physically want to like if you think about a material or a string or something like that if you uh, either you hit it to make it resonate or you sort of um introduce some sort of vibration or or, or friction to it right so the noise is sort of like a friction to the to the to the object so you're you're introducing like a bow or something like that that gives it energy and it, it resonates so if you want to make like a fading in sound you can you can fade in the noise envelope by just dragging it to the side and again we can mix on the impulse a little bit to get a kind of a more stronger sound And uh, another thing is that you can in, uh, change the density of the noise. So if you don't want this sort of like always high power noise, you can change the density to something lower, 
which will sound kind of more grainy. And really low settings, that will kind of be like little little uh, pebbles hitting the material. Um, so there's like a lot of interesting ways to interact with these different parts of the modal synthesis. And um, I think it should jump over to the resonance parameter because it's quite nice to play with with the noise. So um, the resonance parameter here, or Q, controls um, controls the yeah the resonance of the bandpass filters, which which makes the sound kind of ring out more or less. So if I increase it a lot, we'll have this long resonance. And if I decrease it. We'll almost only hear the, the noise. So for example, if you want to make something like a snare, um, you might want to have a little bit of noise, quite a low resonance, and then there you go. Because it's essentially hitting like a membrane and, and the noise part, since the resonance is low, the noise part kind of takes over and that becomes more of the sound. Um, but it's a lot of fun. Uh, I'm a big fan of modal synthesis because <laughs> uh, it's so weird. But a lot of people make stuff that just kind of like, I, I think this is sort of the the general ethos of, 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 of Opal is sort of this like, Okay, yeah, let's just use the synthesis method to make stuff that's kind of weird and, and wacky in its, in its own language. Like, what does modal synthesis do that's really interesting? And then try to dig in more into that rather than what can we, what kind of real world instrument can we make with it or stuff like that. It's not, it's not trying to be a specific sound, it's just trying to do its thing. <laughs> um, so it's, you know, it's very it's meant to be very open-ended and for you to sort of decide what do I want to do with this type of synthesis. So the secondary way to, to change the timbre of, the, of, of mass is by changing the levels of each partial. And we do this with this form, um, well, it, there's two controls, but the form control here changes um, sort of the, the shape of all of the partials. So as you can see, it creates this kind of comb filter-esque. Uh... So this makes all kind of weird formanty bell sounds, everything. Um, and it's really fun to find different positions that do different kind of sounds. And then, of course, you can combine this with different uh, different settings with the warp and the 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 spread. And uh, one cool thing about um, this form control is that if I reset to sort of the basic setting, I could pull it all the way um, to the top right, and it will become a square wave. Uh, let's see if I can reset to what I had going because I liked it. Nice. <laughs> you can also change the face of this um, control, which means that you kind of move around which partials it's it's interacting with in a way, which is. Um, which lets you create different, you know, different weights on the on the sound. And the other way to change the timbre with um, um, with uh, amplitude is to use this control up here, which is the tilt. This um, basically tilts all the partials the other way around. So instead of having a sound that's like more maybe bass frequency, you can choose to accentuate the higher um, sounds, uh, the higher frequencies. 
So if we want to like make a hi hat. do something like this and the third way <laughs> is this cut control here which lets you remove partials uh, either from the bass frequency i should reset the sound for this so it's a little more so you can like remove lower ends of the spectrum or a higher end so that lets us um oh, let's try and get back to where we were so for example, in this sound, I might want to remove the sort of bass frequency. And just have this as my sound. So again, a very versatile type of synthesis for making a kind of wacky percussion. And um, I think uh, I think it would be cool to make like a like a melody with it, maybe. Um, and again, this has um, the same controls here, envelope, pitch envelope, as, as gem. So I think I'm gonna attempt like a little melody. So I'm gonna reset a lot of these sounds. to the noise level. Cool. And then a little higher. Let's start doing poly polyrhythms because it's so much fun.
form face. using here is uh, another lock that is called nudge and this lets you offset um, any step like micro time it forward so if we listen now to this we have these two notes that kind of creates these little little like and uh, what's happening there is that this um, right here, this step is shifted forwards um, um, halfway in between these two. So uh, this scale shows like micro timing between these two steps and the middle part is like a 32 note in between if you're running it at, at one to one. Uh, this can be used to program in swing or make like these sort of little trills and stuff like that.
pretty much mass, I think. Uh, and yeah, quick question time. Very quick, quicker, quick. Gotta get this. Gotta get this. Uh, gotta get through all this. I don't get the difference between the two numbers in modulo. Yeah, modulo is a little special. So the difference between the no two numbers is this right one um, represents the amount of times you count the loop happening. And the first number represents which of these counts that the step should actually trigger on. So if I just load a new pattern here, we can see this more clearly. So if I, if I look at this now, um, it always counts the loops as one. So it's like one, 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 one. It's always resetting after one loop. But if I increase it to two, it will be like one, two, one, two. So I can then tell this step to only trigger on the first of those two counts. So it's be one, two, one, two. And this goes all the way up to eight counts like that. So essentially it's how many times to count the pattern and then which of those counts you trigger on. Um, yeah. Cool. A uh, really nice way to introduce variation and all, all kinds of fun. Um, okay, let's talk about dust. So as I said before, um, is there any way to preview a trig um, for ones that don't happen every eight bar? Um, <laughs> in, in this version that I'm using, there is, uh, in, in the, because someone asked me about this feature, um, and I believe it's like, how do, you, how do you do it? No, okay, well, I messed that up. It's a shame. Um, no. Um, yes, yeah, someone asked me about how to how to uh, like do trigger pre previous moves. Not this version, but um, essentially, we'll add that feature in at some point to preview a trig. Um, so, currently, no. Um, in any case. <laughs> undo but <laughs> sometimes you forget that this is not a hardware device I feel like anyway uh, um, dust let's talk about dust so uh, as I said before this is like a, a, a pulsar noise generator uh, the pulsar is a sort of subset of granular synthesis it's using small snippets of sound playing them back really fast on top of each other and together they form a sort of cloud and generates uh, uh, sound. Um, so if we just listen to, whoops, if we just listen to that, it just kind of sounds like a low-pitched noise. So the idea here is sort of to be able to generate different kinds of noise shapes without using filters, without using like the classic sound shaping stuff that you would go for, but instead do stuff that's more like um, in the sort of sound generation itself. So if I if I uh, now remove uh, basically this um, random, why is this not highlighting? Hello, weird. Um, if I now remove this random amount, it will just be kind of like a tone. Um, and if I increase the amount of random in the sound, it will start to sound like noise. And, and the reason why this happens is that every time it makes one of these tiny little grains, it can randomize the pitch of that. So when you have a lot of those little grains working together and all of them are randomized, you get sort of a cluster which creates noise. And 
this lets you really shape the noise and decide kind of how how coarse you want it or how tonal or kind of which range so if you want like a more high pitched closer to white noise you can uh, increase the pitch and the amount and you will get something more more richer um, So essentially, this becomes uh, what you could refer as like banded noise. It has like an, an, a narrow band with it, which it operates in. And um, you can also change how long each of the like grains are. So if I increase this amount right here, I will increase sort of the length and the rate of each uh, little grain. So if I increase that. You sort of hear each individual uh, granule more clearly. <laughs> Down to these weird like spectral washes almost. And uh, I just really wanted to make like a noise synth where you can sort of navigate between these different types of sounds. Like if you want to make weird computer noise, like spectral noise stuff, yes. If you want to make like white noise, yes. If you want to make pink noise, yes. If you want to make white noise, yeah. Uh, tonal noise, uh, whatever. It should be able to sort of do it all. Um, and you can also adjust sort of the so each grain plays back in a little window and that's sort of what makes this granular um, thing happen so what you can do is control the pitch of each grain in, independent from sort of the rate they're played back in and this also lets you color the sound in different ways Um, and you can decrease the density of the grains, how many are playing at once. Which can make, you can make these kind of like, almost like pebble-ish sounds, like you're throwing some like, like little um, pebbles around or... Um, yeah. It also has frequency modulation per grain, so um, you can introduce the, uh, you can like add spectral, uh, spectral, you can, <laughs> yeah, it's basically just FM synthesis of each grain. So each grain is per de default like a sine wave, but then you can make it more complex by introducing FM. Which can have in sort of a signal processing way, disastrous results. <laughs> but you can make it, you can use it to make really like high density white noise. Or if it decreased the amount of random, just a more detailed. Quite an interesting, quite an interesting little synthesizing the sound of gently and carefully spilling a bag of gravel. Yeah, it's like <laughs> it's a performance piece. Uh, uh, oh, I hit the camera again with my leg. Uh, yeah, um, so the FM is pretty useful to make different sort of, doesn't have to be this harsh either. It's funny because it's essentially like a strange 
FM synth as well, which is really useful because it has uh, sort of built-in detune functionality. So it works with a, this bank of, of, of generators, right? So this spread control right here let's just spread all these six oscillators individually which is like why where is this going to lead us well if we pitch it up a little higher we'll start reaching some sort of like classic start reaching some classic higher territory if we remove a little bit of frequencies with the tone tone uh, filter we can get quite nice metallic hi hats Or maybe like more of a cowbell thing. <laughs> so yeah, quite a versatile approach to making noise. I've always wanted to do something where it's not just a noise generator being filtered, you're generating noise um, by using this these oscillators. And I think that's really fun. Um, and uh, lastly, we have this control called blur. And to best illustrate this, we can lower the density. And maybe a little higher frequency so if I increase blur it will sort of diffuse each grain a little bit so instead of sounding sharp it will sound quite um, it will lose its edge sort of up until the point where it becomes almost a mass of sound so if you have these long You can almost make them sound like a whole wash. And as you hear, it's like very alien sounding. And it will sort of react. So you can make a lot of weird. So this is all about like making these sort of almost unexpected timbres sometimes. And uh, yeah, um, lastly, this does not have a pitch envelope. It has ratchet envelope instead, which means that, because I really like claps. <laughs> um, so this one is, is uh, sort of with that in mind. So uh, maybe an okay. Just a little. Let's do the same. So say I want this to sound more like a clap, then I can introduce with this control right here that's highlighted, I can change how many times this sound is repeated. <laughs> Up to 16 times. So this kind of makes the clap sound happen. And you can change how long each little clap is. Up to really long weird. 
Because, you know, why wouldn't you want to do something weird sometimes? So. <laughs> so, oops, repeat 16 times and then... Um, and this happens before the amp envelope stage. So you can do things like it, it sort of claps and then it goes into an attack. So yeah, as with anything in Opal, this is just designed to like make sounds that are new, you know? There's no, nothing here being modeled from any other type of drum or drum synth ever. It's just new stuff, which I think is really exciting. Um, I think, you know, there's so many samples out there that people could use to have normal percussion so why shouldn't drum synths and rhythm machines be a little weirder you know you can make normal sounds if you want but it can also make a lot of strange things that interact nicely with the sequencer so it's a living organism almost in a way oops it's nice um yeah what to do with this in the pattern let's see where we're at yeah i mean okay let's do it it's getting late you know so <laughs> let's just make a clap i love a good clap sound like i think it's underrated or whatever I don't know maybe a lot of people use clap I'm whatever uh, <laughs> but I think we should also lock in some um, some hi-hats and I guess I should probably show probability also I'm I'm not the biggest random fan but let's do it for the sake of illustration you know let's make this a little longer without okay let's mute everything let's try and program both claps and some sort of like little hi-hat thing on this uh, so let's decrease the ratchet count on this one. Okay. Maybe a little less random. Oh. And uh, maybe more spread. Oh. Oh. Yeah, it's a success. All right. Uh, Let's see, that sounds a really dinky pattern. Ah, that was kind of kind of not so cool. Let's try and uh, do um doo -doo -doo. Is there an idiot proof way of adjusting the velocity of a tree without running the risk of accidentally deleting it? So, um, the mousing is a little weird sometimes in Max. Uh, maybe this is room for improvement, but a good thing to know is that so when you place a trig, say that I have this sound right here that has like parameter locks and everything, and I, I remove it, the parameter locks will be gone, right? It's reset to its sort of 
initial state. But there is a sort of safeguard here. So if I if I now drag down here um, to zero, it won't actually delete um, any information until I release the mouse button again. So that's good to know that as long as you're holding down um, your right, uh, your left click mouse button, it won't actually delete it. So until you press release, <laughs> that's good to know. Okay, let's let's introduce a little bit of like uh, randomness here. Um, so probability, the little percentage sign right down here in this uh, lock row, let's just set, set like the chance of each trigger uh, triggering. Um, and this essentially means that each time it goes over this uh, step, um, it, it sort of makes a call like, should it be triggered or not? So let's lower some of these a little bit and uh, see what happens. Um, this will introduce like a fair amount of randomness to the pattern. So now we have like a pattern that's sort of always a little different, which is uh, pretty cool. It's pretty neat with hi hats, I think. I'm, Again, not the biggest fan of random, but I'll do it for my fans. No, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> uh, and we can also talk a little bit about this control ratchet right here. Um, this uh, lets you repeat a step um, a couple of times. So let's let's just look at this new pattern for 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 uh, convenience sake. So. Um, uh, let's see this. Uh, so this lets you ratchet lets you re-trigger this step up to eight times. <laughs> um, which is nice. Uh, lets you do like these little uh, fast hi hats or whatever. And if we listen in like a slower tempo, you kind of more hear what's happening when I do like eight of them or something like that. And you can also change the sort of trajectory of how those so like they're grouped evenly now they're spaced evenly but you can also change the spacing so if i change this to like a more like it kind of jumps into it or jump like it um <laughs> you can do these things where they kind of fade in and fade out and yeah i think at some point it should have sort of like a yeah whatever there will be some cool updates one day um, yeah, let's go back to the pattern. section down mm. quick questions quick questions you got five seconds <laughs> um, I promised myself it would be less than two hours but I, I don't think that's quite doable um, sequencer wise is it possible to do true polyrhythms or just polymeters um, yes you can well <laughs> Yes and no. I mean, so you can't like change the grid. So it's like you're programming polyrhythms all of a sudden. It will always be sort of divided into equal distance slices. But what you can do is set, for example, like a, a, a track length of uh, 12 with a time division of three quarters, 
which means essentially that it will play back an eighth note triplet. So you can have one track doing triplets and another doing something else, but you can't like have one track doing both triplets and um, other stuff. But you can delay one note into a triplet in between two other notes, but you can't like program in between the grid, grid so to speak. I hope that makes sense. Um, does this app send MIDI out? No. It does not. It only sequences its internal stuff, which is it's not MIDI at all, actually. <laughs> um, so uh, where were we? Dust. Dust. From, from dust till dawn. Quinn septuples? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. No, no. No, I think uh, I think I think this sort of step sequencer, when you start adding that sort of complexity, it's very hard to make it um, like instantly playable. So it's it's a trade off. Um, there's no like super advanced polyrhythm stuff going on there. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, it is fair. Thank you. <laughs> I appreciate that. Um, okay, so let's move on to Slate. Um, this is a sampler, and uh, yeah, it's our first instrument that does anything that's not synthesis, which is, or some sort of effect, which is cool. It's been uh, really fun to work with, honestly. Um, and it's sort of, um, I would say, oh, now I realize I wanna, really want to add some reverb to the, whatever. Uh, <laughs> um, essentially, the structure is sort of a simple, good sounding sampler, um, which you can set a start point, a length, a loop point, and I'll show how that works. Um, but then it has this whole granular part of it, which lets you really zoom in on different parts of a sound. So let's just listen. Um, multi-channel audio out, yes. Uh, let's, we can talk about that later. But yeah, it does multi-channel audio out. Um, um, so, uh, I keep knocking my camera. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> sampler. Um, currently I have some stuff loaded in, um, like this bass drum, a little clap through a spring reverb, Felicia saying various things <laughs> in, a, Burst into the room. in a cool Burst voice, into the room. um, a little saw, but I could also load something in from, uh, uh, oh, um, let me just... Can load something in from uh, from my uh, let's let's look at the um, I'll load in this uh, class I have like a, yeah maybe the symbol sound is nice um, you can just drag and drop that into the into the engine um, and uh, sorry I didn't show that but basically you just can drag and drop from the live browser into into that uh, part of the device this it says nothing loaded, drop a sample, and it will just load it and represent it in this uh, fashion. Um, so uh, it has, so these different uh, lines here represent the start and the length of playback. So um, you can essentially create a little playback window which you can move around. So length is always relative to start. So when you move around the start point, the length or rather the end of playback will uh, also um, follow. So if I only want this part, if the sample, it will play that back. Um, and I just really appreciate being able to have a little window to move around rather than having like sample, like start and end. This becomes more like a playable uh, parameter. Um, so we can also set it to loop instead of just play once. 
and uh, the loop and start and everything has uh, a de-clicking algorithm um, which makes every time you make a loop you don't need to land on a zero crossing or anything it will always make sure that it's smoothed it out a little, little bit um, it's kind of tweaked to retain transients but also give clickless playback um, which I think is really nice even to really short loops Um, and um, you can also change the direction so for example if you want it to be reverse you can click this icon up here and it will bring a little menu where you can choose between forward reverse and ping pong so reverse of course uh, <laughs> it won't really hear because the end will open yeah so it will reverse um, the sample um, if I choose ping pong it will Go forward, backward, and then back again. Which I think is a lot of fun. Which I think is especially nice on like um, voice samples. <laughs> And uh, yeah, let's just reset that. Um, and then it has uh, something called loop point. Let's maybe show that in, yeah, let's do the voice sample. Um, so for example, maybe I want to only loop like this section right here. I wanted to start at the, at the start and then loop over here. So I can do that by changing this parameter loop right here. This adds a third, um, a third line. And if I put that right here, it means that it will loop between these two points. And this is useful for if you have like an instrument sound where you want to just like keep one part of it, but have like, you know, you want to listen to the transient. Um, you want to retain the transient, but you want to like, you want to extend part of its sound. But yeah, um, it's, you know, simple, but quite powerful in a way. But where it gets, um, where it gets really uh, interesting is with the granular mode. Just wanted to say that Opal looks amazing. Thank you so much. Um, so where it gets interesting is with the grains mode. So when you enable grains, uh, this toggle right here, it will start playing the sample back through granular synthesis. So it divides the sample into tiny, tiny granules, which is placed back uh, sort of like a little cloud and, and almost reconstructs the original sample. And uh, this specific algorithm is sort of based on time stretch where each sample follows the other and they kind of, kind of create this long version of the original. So if nothing is changed, it will sound slightly muffled. And this is because the because of the playback, the sort of um, the um, transient is, is, is not quite there, but we'll we'll get into how to like fix that or, or play with that later uh, in a little bit. And you can change the amount of grains from a very low amount of two, which can be cool for some effects, um, up to 24 grains. And of course, the more grains, the more processing power it will use. So um, 16 is kind of a nice sounding setting that isn't too taxing on the CPU. But let's bump it up to 24 just for fun's sake. Um, we can change, so what we can change is the rate of playback. Let's maybe take a sound where it's a little more obvious what's going on. So we have this, uh, clap sound through a spring reverb and if i enable granular and change the rate so rate here um, becomes sort of the speed of playback but without changing the pitch so if i lower that
it's essentially just stretching the sound out um, and or we're making it go faster oh. um, and the granular engine is quite organic so sometimes weird stuff can happen which I think is pretty cool because um, it's like it's literally just like scanning through a sound with these tiny grains and trying to reconstruct it um, and in grain mode you can also change the oh, change the pitch without changing the speed of playback so again the original was this clap um, and one thing you can do here now, uh, say that you have this bass drum and you want it to have part of it to be granular, but retain sort of the initial transients. So then you can use this control right here, which is called the grain fade. So introducing this a little bit will fade in the granular effect. So this lets you have a transient, but it goes into um, granular playback. So if I change the rate here, <laughs> it will sort of pause on a part of the sound. And <laughs> in my mind, I, I think about this like some sort of bullet time effect where it slows down the playback. And you can kind of get it to start just like as you would do with the loop position like you start at some point and, and end up in another this sort of starts with with the original transient sound intact but then it kind of goes into this grain thing and um, zooms in on the sound um, so yeah um. <laughs> Just a rim shot. Um, and then we can change, change this uh, a little bit more. Let's do another voice thing. Um, so, um, so let's, let's enable. Whoop. Um, we can also change sort of the position where it's so, so right now the granular playback is just going through the sample linearly it's sort of like you know all of them are oh. <laughs> okay <laughs> all of them are just going through the sample like in a circle sort of but you can change the way they read so they kind of all the grains sort of grab different parts of the sample so when you introduce increase the spray parameter it changes the order essentially randomizes the position of each grain. So instead of being like a smooth, you can do more like a... Which just creates this this strange random cloud. And you can also change the density of the the granular engine. So Right now they're all playing at once, but you can change sort of the the chance of each grain playing, which introduces gaps. Um, loop it again. Um, and lastly, this parameter blur will, will 
add diffusion to each grain, which can sound kind of like a reverb, but it can be useful for either smoothing out the sound or just making sort of an effect. So. So at max, we'll just create this cloud of grains. Um, yeah. Uh, the last parameter of the sampler is gain, which just lets you oops, <laughs> lets you gain the sample. So if you have like quiet parts, like if we want to zoom in on this part, we can we can introduce some grain a gain there to to really. <laughs> make whatever this is more audible. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's pretty much the granular engine. Um, it's really fun to make textures with. I love using it on voice. Um, and yeah, like I said, I mean, all these things are sort of have this idea of how to do percussion, but uh, they should be able to do kind of everything, I think. Uh, it's so much fun to just make, uh, decide for yourself what you want to do with, with a kind of sound generation tool. So um, see what we can do with it. Um, I think I'm just going to pop some voice in here because that's what I always do. <laughs>
could also, of course, I mean, with all these things, as I said, you can lock anything. So we could lock this step to a different sample. Uh, didn't even see. throw in a little rim shot in there um, so let's do that let's lock this one start play the whole sample no attack no grain mode and just do sample four Is that right okay yeah <laughs> Every third time of uh, the loop. question time about slate or anything really before I move on to the final thing uh, don't know if I actually need this one but yeah Okay, let's look at the effects. Um, we've been using them. Well, the reverb. Um, bingo, got all these nice engines uh, connected to it. So basically the, the effect track is two engines in one. And one engine interacts more with the sequencer and the other engine reacts more with the different sounds being sent to it. The reverb takes signal from all the other tracks. It's a send effect. And the flock sampler is um, more of a tr sequencer trigger effect. So that's why there's two of them. And that's why um, you get kind of, you know, you can, you can kind of choose how you want to interact with the different sounds using the effects track. Like, do you want to sequence something or do you just want it to like flow with everything else in a way? So um, let's first look at the void reverb. Um, and we're hearing it right now. Let's maybe only listen to the melody here. So one cool thing about um, the reverb is that since it's a send effect, it will not be like dry wet. It will just be how much signal it gets into it. But the channels in Opal in the mixer are the levels or the rather the reverb send is pre fader. So if I lower the volume of this track that's playing right here with the melody, you'll still hear it through the reverb. And this just lets you mix things in in a more conscious way. So if I want this 
this track to be fully in the reverb and nothing else. I can do that by just lowering the volume of, of, of the sound like pre um, or rather post reverb sound. <laughs> Um, and the reverb, um, as I said briefly in the introduction of all devices, is sort of a mix between, between three different methods of making diffused sound or reverb sound or whatever. Um, it has three different stages that you can mix between. So it has a diffusing stage, which is, which is what the input hits first, which kind of smooths the sound out. Then you have early reflections, which is sort of what instantly hits you um, uh, as a more like wash of, of sound. And then you have the late stage reflection, which is this long tail. And by balancing these different reverbs um, in it, or sort of the structure of it, you can sort of coax different types of uh, rooms and tones and stuff out of it. So, um, um, the input stage here has a um, shelving EQ, so I can, for example, reduce the low shelf. We could try this on a new pattern um, with, with uh, maybe like a bass drum, um, like this spring, you can listen to that. Um, and, and again, the, the reverb is made to respond quite well to percussion. Um, so you get sort of a like a instant um, slap, but also like a long tail. Um, but it can be tweaked to do all kinds of things. Um, but if we now reduce the low end, you can hear that all the low end goes away. Similarly with the high shelf. So the input EQ is the input EQ is really useful to shape the overall sound of the reverb. Um, it in some ways often it can even be more effective than EQing the reverb itself. Um, because like the, the, the sound you're sending into it essentially becomes part of the whole effect, right? So um, maybe we want like a little less bass and a little more treble for a really bright, nice reverb. And this control right here is the diffuse part. So at minimum, we'll sort of just create, let's listen to it up close um, without so this is the diffuse part of the diffuser part of the reverb. It's just kind of like the original sound, but but smoothed out. And if I increase this, <laughs> it sort of makes this longer, kind of sometimes grainy version of the sound. And uh, it sounds kind of similar. It's inspired by like early reverbs that use this sort of nonlinear. Um, algorithm I believe it's called and it's useful to kind of shape the transient response of the reverb so sometimes you want it really snappy and sometimes you want it to be more like um, fade in and, and nice um, so let's do a little a little bit of a fade just for for, for fun um, and next we have the early reflections as you see that Brings in a dimensionality to everything. And it's this quick slapback of, of, of uh, diffused sound where you sort of get a sense of the room. And you can change the size. And um, lastly, we have the late signal which makes this long, long, long diffuse signal. And um, you can control the size, as I said, of, of the room, <laughs> the space, 
and the tail and the tail is sort of the feedback of the the reverb which can either create this kind of shorter spaces or if you increase it really long it will just keep the sound on forever almost it's into a wash <laughs> And chorus um, sort of introduces modulation into the signal, which uh, is, is more useful to listen to on like a tonal. Um, let's listen to this saw. <laughs> let's make a little melody real quick. Uh, no idea how this will sound like. Bad, probably. But. It's only for the sake of illustration, so maybe that's okay. So <laughs> with a lot of uh, chorus modulation, um, it will sound kind of wild like this, but you can, the top control controls the depth of the modulation. Basically, you just make a live there, reverb. If you turn it completely down, it will be more flat in response in a way, and a little bit of chorus. So, if you want these sort of like big '90s IDM reverbs, you want to apply a little bit of modulation there, and yeah, um, and this bottom control just controls the speed of modulation, basically. Let's bring this back a little bit. Um, and finally, we have this output tone control or control tone control of the reverb, and this lets you sculpt the sort of um, the tail uh, uh, signal itself, which in this example is quite subtle, um, but if you reduce the low end, different kinds of reverbs where um, the higher frequencies damp faster or the lower damp faster and that kind of gets you different tonalities of reverb. And you can really hear this when you for example set a low gain of the of the lower frequencies and increase the feedback. kind of just really washes out into this kind of mid-high. And finally, we have this damp control, which controls more the early reflections, the overall response of the reverb. So if we want something super muffled, we can just pull down the frequency of all of this. Um, and by balancing these different, and lastly, this mixer stage lets you balance the different types of reverbs. So to just create different spaces, really, you could remove the diffuse in the early and just listen to the late.
that's the reverb. You can do a lot of different cool spaces with it um, and vary its tonality a lot. Um, and now let's go back to our pattern that we had going and uh, and let's look at the flux sampler. So um, we actually don't need any of the tracks going for this because <laughs> the flux sample always records. Um, it doesn't matter if they're muted or not. As long as the track is playing, it will record into flux. So the, if I add a trig now in this reverb flux track, let's just adjust the reverb to something a little like we had going. Something like that, a little more. Da -da. Yep. Um, so if I trigger it now, um, it will do nothing. <laughs> and the reason for this is because we got the slice, this control, set to zero. And this means that it doesn't trigger anything. And this is important because sometimes you want to just modulate the reverb and not the um, not trigger, uh, trigger slices. Um, but what we can do is raise that to one, which means that it will always trigger. Basically, if you think about um, the recording length as the pattern or, or 16 steps of the pattern rather <laughs> it will record for example this gem track all the way through so if i then think about every one of these as the slices the steps basically are the slices so this will slice one up to one two three four five six seven eight so this sound will be on one this will be on seven that will be on eight so uh if i now play it back I'll hear the pattern <laughs> and um, I could trigger it multiple times, for example. And the recording is changing between because the pattern is polymetric right now. We have different lengths of different tracks, so it won't always sound the same on all the loops, right? So. And then I can also change the decay of that. So it's just like little snippets. And maybe I want to pick out a, so a sound from a different step. you can pitch that and kind of have fun with it which is weird and stuff and, um, <laughs> but when it gets really interesting is activating the grain mode because of course this also has <laughs> granular processing so when I enable grains here I'll get this weird playback Now it's essentially just playing back those slices, but kind of not um, changing, uh, uh, kind of not like actually playing back the actual sound, which is processing in this wild way. And then we could pitch that up, for example. So if we listen at the same time, it will sound crazy, probably. Yeah, it's a little too much, but <laughs> um, it's for demonstration purposes. But uh, so we can do things like we got this slice selected, but we change like which slice and randomize that. So you can have like a the pattern but randomized. You can add spray just like on the slate sampler so it kind of changes the playback position and again blur just adding some diffusion to the playback so it becomes almost like a second reverb <laughs> 
And then there's this little control right here, which sort of randomizes the octave of the green. It kind of creates like a shimmering. It's kind of subtle sometimes, but... But let's try and use this in a more um, um, productive way, I suppose. Um, maybe if we have like 10 steps, because we're already on this weird uh, maybe half time. sort of evolving itself in a strange way and uh, another thing I think that's uh, quite fun is I, w I really wanted the reverb to be on its own track for um, to make it interactable with the sequencer right so I could I could do fun things like modulating the uh, modulating the uh, the size <laughs> look at the configuration page which is least exciting probably <laughs> so now if we're happy with all this stuff I can name it uh, show and tell and export this data as uh, show tell patterns and this will essentially create a file which you can then reload into another opal um, but naturally of course everything you do will be saved with your live set so when you save your live set, it will, it, will, it will be there, and when you recall it, it will be there. But you could also sort of make a backup or send to a friend or whatever. Um, you can also copy a pattern. So if you press copy here, you will, you will see that it says which pattern has been copied. 
and then we can go to, for example, pattern 12 and paste it. Um, and we can rename it to something more sensible. Show me. Um, and that will be the same pattern. So maybe we'll change something up here where we have like, uh, uh, not as much stuff going on. going so now let's automate switching between them so uh, now we created our little pattern here and our little variation and uh, what we can do is uh, uh, yes all right so what we can do now is that opal has a few automation lanes so uh, the one we are worrying about right now is active pattern um, and that just changes between these two different um, slots. So right now we're playing pattern 11 or something. Wow, why is it so, wow. Uh, okay, okay. Uh, uh. So uh, for example, maybe I want to keep this running for a while and then change to pattern 12. I just write that into the automation like this. And you can also use automation to mute and uh, change if the track is playing or not. So for example, maybe maybe we want this a little later uh, right here. And first we want to sort of change uh, how we want to sort of make an arrangement. So then we can, um, for example, do this uh, automation link called track state. And this basically controls if the triggers on the track are actually triggering or not. So uh, that one should be uh let's for example take uh, so now if i turn down this dust track state it won't actually play the triggers <laughs> similar with like the effects track state so it won't play back our our slice stuff until it hits this uh, sort of apex or whatever you want to call it um, we can also use this um, output level um, control to maybe fade in the the melody here at the beginning 
So these are all different automation lane, uh, automation controls that you can do to sort of build an arrangement with Opal. <laughs> right there instead of over there um, so this can be used to sort of build an arrangement you can also do um, pitch offsets with this so for example this pitch offset um, uh, automation um, let's do this pitch so we can do like a little uh, uh, maybe I want to do like a hi-hat that kind of pitches down right here I can do that like this <laughs> Probably want to like do like a nice drop of the bass drum, uh, <laughs> you know, because why not? Why not? Uh... So now we created a little arrangement. stuff like this. <laughs> uh, yeah, and that kind of sums it up. That sums Opal up, I think. Um, what did I miss? Not much, hopefully. Um, there's also, as I said, um, all of these synths that we went through, um, you can also use those as individual devices. So if I want to play gem as like a more tonal synth, oh, that was very high up. I can do that and kind of more like maybe build a little rack with void. Um, I can do this in the live... Uh, um, Of course, it has the modulation and everything that, that the main device has. Um, so this is just, you know, to allow different types of using them. And, and if you want to like, you know, layer maybe more gem on top of that stuff or have like some sample thing going while they're sequencing in Opal and just like the freedom of choice, basically. And just having these, these nice um, uh, different devices available. Um, and someone asked about individual outputs, so how to do that. As I said, um, Opal has individual outs. Um, so say that I want to um, I want to process all of these tracks individually. Um, I can create another audio track and select audio from Opal, and I'll get all of its, its different um, tracks here as individual outputs. So if I monitor that now, I'll hear just gem or mass or just the reverb or just the slice effect or the flux effect. So that's how individual outputs work. You just kind of make another track and route it out. Um, 
and presets that were created with individual versions of gem etc be imported used in opal no so the thing is that opal uses its own uh preset um it's its completely own preset um uh format and this is because of like how the sequencer works and how it you know stores all its data it can't really make use of the same kind of presets as 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 what's default in live so you can save um, a preset that was made in Opal um, as a JSON file. So this is the same functionality as the import export on the configuration page, but it's per track. So if you select, for example, mass and say that you want to save this um, mass sound. you like that and you want that as a preset then you hold down control or command on a Mac and press that um, track and you'll get a little save prompt and maybe you should name it probably mass underline bell um, and this then gets saved as a JSON file we can view it in text editor um, and uh, we get this mass preset with all the different parameters basically um, so then um, you can re-import that let's say we make another pattern um, you re-import that by dragging it down to the device on, down here and it loads up the same sound um, um, and um, yeah, and someone asked how to change the colors of the standalone versions. Um, this is again done with a JSON file. So there's this file that's in the default um, Opal project called, um, ah, where did I put this now? <laughs> no, oh yeah, right here in the, in the devices. So here's a file called color.json. So this one is the same, um, sorry, it's maybe a little small. Open sublime text. So this is the same um, setting uh, that you get in uh, the main Opal device, um, the, the sort of U shift. So if you like, for example, this setting of 224.50, you can enter it as data here. And just save this color.json and um, your individual devices when they're loaded will will switch to this color. This is I just uh, I just really love being able to change the color myself. So I really wanted that for the individual devices too, even though it's maybe a little too uh, nerdy. But um, yeah, um, yeah. Can you put MIDI device before Opal like Jog or an arpeggiator? No, it doesn't have any MIDI in. Um, in that way, the sequencer is sort of like the boss of it. Um, to do like MIDI stuff, you'll have to use the individual devices. But I could I could see that functionality being possible in the future. I could see some use cases where that would be quite nice. So that could potentially be added. Um, yeah. Now I'll just I don't know I'll just play some patterns and and you all write some questions and after that I I think I really need to stop because it's been going for three hours but it's also a big device um, uh, and you know uh, we're just so happy with the feedback we've gotten on Opal it took a long time to develop it's been a very big undertaking for for me <laughs> and uh, I'm very happy with how it came out and and really happy that everyone thinks it's cool. So big thanks to all y'all. Uh, let's, uh, let's do some pattern here. I had like some weird techno thing going. No. <laughs>